Do you believe you are fully known and fully loved? When I ask that question, I, I don't want us to like just Jesus juke ourselves. We're in church, the answer is yes. I want us to honestly evaluate. Because the question I'm asking is not, do you intellectually assent to the idea that scripture declares you're fully known by God and yet still fully loved? The question I'm really trying to get towards is, is are you experiencing that in your life? Are you experiencing the weight of being fully known by God and still being fully loved by him at the same time? Think about the implications of that statement, fully known. This means that there is nothing that God is unaware of. There's no darkness his eyes can't pierce. There's nothing hidden from his sight. He knows all about you. He even knows the number of hairs on your head. Like I got some hair, okay? And it cha- the number changes every day. He knows everything about you intimately. He knows the great stuff, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the ugly stuff. He knows your history. He knows what you're dealing with today and he knows what will come in the future. You are fully known. And this is the easier part of the statement to agree with. I mean, he's God. Of course he knows everything. Like, that's kind of what comes with being God. It's part and parcel, right? But the question we're wrestling with here is, if I'm fully known, can I still be fully loved? Because I don't know about you, but I got some things back here in, in the information in my history and, and things that I've walked in that, that isn't so lovable. I've got some things today that the Lord is transforming that aren't so beautiful. So do you believe you're fully known and yet still fully loved? I think about that idea of being fully loved. That, that our, perf- our, our, our God, rather, God's love for us is not based off of our performance. Rather, it's, it's rooted in his character. God's love for us is not based off of our performance. It's rooted in who he is. God is love. And anytime we tend to doubt that God loves us because we know there's some junk in our past or there's some junk in our present, we look to the cross as the definitive statement that we are fully known and yet still fully loved. Today we're beginning a series called Psalm 51. and We're going to be looking at a guy who learned the implications and truth of that statement. His name's David, King David. And if you're, if you're not familiar with David as a character in the Bible, he, he's uh, kind of the headline story for David. He's the guy who killed a giant Philistine guy named Goliath with a sling and stone. You probably heard that story. Same guy. He, w- he used to be a little shepherd boy. Uh, he slew that giant. God anointed him to be king over his people, Israel. And In the story that we're going to be jumping into today, David is in his kingship. And he's one of the great leaders of Israel. But the story that's going to set us up for this series is a story where David has a major integrity gap. Where he abuses his power and he sins and his sin comes to light. And he learns the truth that you can be fully known, warts and all, and still be fully loved in God. So to set us up, before we jump into the passage in Psalm 51, we're going to be reading in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And throughout this series, we have um, two aims, really. Firstly, we want all of us, myself included, all of us together as God's people at Family Church to grow in our experience of being fully known and yet still fully loved. And the second aim is that we would have a greater understanding of what repentance is. Repentance is often kind of billed as this, oh, that's kind of a gnarly word. You see it in movies with, you know, the apocalyptic movies where guys are on the street and they're holding these signs. Repent, the end is nigh. But repentance is actually a beautiful thing. And for this series, the teaching team and I have come up with a, kind of a working definition of repentance. It goes like this. Repentance is a remorseful turning away from sin to God. Now we could add lots of detail to this because this is a big concept. 
But in its simplest terms, repentance is turning from sin to God remorsefully. And that word remorse is, is, uh, there's emotion and affection in this because you have offended the God who loves you. You've offended the holy, glorious nature of the God who loves you. So remorseful, turning from sin to God in his tender love and mercy. And we're going to see this in the story of David. So that's our two aims. Um, But before we jump into Psalm 51, uh, I want to get us the context of 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Because Psalm 51 is David's song of repentance. But I want us to be aware of the story that leads him to this moment where he repents and turns to God. So so, Sam. 2 Samuel, (laughs) tripping over my voice, 2 Samuel 11, uh, starting in verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So it's wartime. You and I, we have springtime, summertime. They had wartime, okay? So this is winter's over. Get your battle gear on. We're going to war. So the, na- the, the, the kingdom of Israel, they're out, they're fighting a battle against the Ammonites, and contrary to the customs of the day, David doesn't go. Now in this day, it was very off, uh, it was the custom that the king would go out with the troops in battle, and David chooses to stay back, and he stays at Jerusalem. Verse 2, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. So in this day, uh, David's house, the palace was probably the highest place in the kingdom. He goes out, he gets up on his rooftop, which is not uncommon for this time of day uh, to cool off in the late afternoon. And he's surveying his kingdom And he sees, and we don't know exactly how he sees, but he sees into the home of a woman who is bathing and it says she's very beautiful. Now David has an option right here. He can cut this off and go do something else. But we're going to see what David does. Verse 3, And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, Here's stop sign number one, right? This is, uh, th- you're married, David, but so is she. You're pursuing this. This is going to mean adultery. This is not okay. And not only is she married and you're married, David, but she's married to Uriah the Hittite. She's married to one of your trusted, mighty men of war, one of your valiant soldiers, a trusted servant of you. This would be such a deep betrayal if you continue to pursue this. And the servant gives him this information, but David's lustful desires overwhelm him and he continues to pursue her. So David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David He follows this lustful desire to its fruition. He commits adultery by sleeping with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, committing adultery. And and now there's a baby in the picture as a result of his lustful desires. And, And I've heard this story taught from a distorted uh, picture of what's going on here. So I want to address that. Um, I have heard this story, uh, not overtly stated this way, but the implication was uh, that, that Bathsheba was kind of the town harlot. And she's up there on her rooftop, bathing naked, uh, using her feminine wiles to draw King David into an adulterous affair so that she would bear the son of the king and the heir of the kingdom. And I've heard it taught that way. Um, as I talked to the teaching team, other members said, yeah, we've heard that too. The problem with that is there's no evidence for this in the passage. In fact, the entire flow and cadence of 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is about David's sin over and again. And, and if you look at the evidence, depending on how you weigh the evidence, um, it, it's quite the contrary. Uh, the, the, uh, the word for took in the original language, it can be interpreted one of two ways. Firstly, it could mean that she came, that Bathsheba came willingly. Secondly, it could mean that 
She was forced to come. This was forced upon her. So either she came willingly, who's going to disobey the king, or this was forced upon her. So contrary to the narrative that has been taught that this was Bathsheba trying to woo a man from his leadership position, this, the implication of this story seems to be at best, David was abusing his power and manipulating. At worst, this was forced upon her. And so they, they sleep together and now uh, she's pregnant. And this is where David starts to ramp up in anxiety and try to cover up this whole shindig. So David sent word to Joab. Joab was one of his military leaders. Send me Uriah the Hittite. This is Bathsheba's husband. And when you read that, if you don't know this story, you may think, oh my goodness, David's going to get clean. He's going to come tell uh, Uriah, hey, this happened. I'm sorry. And, and, and make the situation right. Get honest about it. That's not what happens. Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Noticeably, he says nothing about Bathsheba and the affair. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all his servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. So David brings Uriah home from battle. And, and he doesn't say in, in the text at this point what his motivation for doing this. But what can be inferred from the story is he's brought him home so that Uriah will go home to be with his wife. They will sleep together and then this whole sin of David's will be covered over. Uriah will think the baby that is conceived in Bathsheba is his. Everything's smoothed over. David is trying to cover this stuff up. But Uriah refuses to go home. And he's going to tell us why here in a moment. Verse 10. When they told David Uriah did not go down uh, to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. So, so Uriah says, look, how could I go home? My brothers are in battle. My, my leader, Joab, he's off in the war field. They're sleeping in tents. Like, I, I would be betraying my kin to go home and sleep with my wife in the comfort of my home. And in this passage, it's as though the author, he's, he's he, uh, contrasting. David and Uriah. David, a man who doesn't go to battle, stays home and pursues his own selfish desires. And Uriah, a man who, from the evidence we have in Scripture, is a man of integrity. A man who says, I won't even go home to be with my wife because my brothers are still in war. And so David then, he's going to up the ante. Plan A didn't win. Then David, verse 12 said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Plan A didn't work. Plan B is get him drunk. Maybe if his inhibitions are lowered, he'll go. Didn't work. Still, Uriah maintains his integrity. He refuses to go home because his brothers are still out in the battlefield. Plan A didn't work. Plan B didn't work. David's going to continue to try and cover up this problem. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, again, that's his military leader, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. So David's plan now is conspiracy to murder. He's involved Joab in this and, and we don't know why Joab agrees to this whole sordid situation. Maybe he's thinking, man, if I don't do this, maybe somebody else has got my letter. Like, I better, I better toe the line. This is the king after all. And so he, he follows through and he puts Uriah where there's valiant men, mighty warriors. Verse 17, And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. 
Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. So David, he sins with Bathsheba and then he begins to try and manipulate circumstances so this doesn't come to light. But Uriah is not the only uh, victim here in this story. Look at, skip on down to verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she lamented over her husband. That sure doesn't sound like a woman who's trying to draw the king into an adulterous affair by her feminine wiles. It sounds like a woman who just lost the love of her life. Verse 27, And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So here's David a man who's been anointed as king, a man, scripture says, is a man after God's own heart. And he has royally blown it. Pardon the pun, because he's the king. He's royally blown it. And his sin keeps uh, uh, coming uh, to, to over and over and over again. He uh, multiplying and getting bigger and bigger and bigger until somebody dies. And the Lord, in love, Send someone to confront him. Chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. So Nathan was a prophet. Prophets were people who received revelation from God, and they would go and share that revelation um, to a people group or to an individual. And here, Nathan, functioning in the office of prophet, he's received a word from God. He's going to tell David to confront him about his sin. Because Everybody else may have been fooled, but the Lord saw what David did and was displeased with his actions. Verse 2, the rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. So, Nathan is telling him this parable. He's, he's, he's contrasting a rich man who has a bunch of sheep and a poor man who has one ewe lamb. And this lamb is, is more like a, a family member. And um, he goes on here in verse four. Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So the rich man, with all of his flocks, he gets a guest who comes. He's unwilling to use his own resources, so he steals the poor man's lamb, slaughters it, feeds his guest. Now remember, David was a shepherd. He knows the connection between a shepherd and his sheep, the care, the protection, the work that goes into it. And as Nathan unpacks this story uh, about how this lamb was like, like like a part of the family, David can Feel this viscerally, and it shows in his response. Verse 5, Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan. Now, commentators are split on this. Um, some, some, some believe that David saw that this was a parable and that Nathan was trying to make a point. Others believe at the, up to this point that he didn't, that he thought this was a problem that actually happened in his kingdom that he was judging over. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So he's made his judgment. This man deserves death. Verse seven, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. No, Nathan says, thus says the Lord, because he's functioning in that prophetic gifting, that prophetic role that God had blessed him with, and he's giving to David revelation that he's received. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Saul was the, the, pro, the previous king who, when he found out David was the heir to the throne, uh, wanted to destroy him. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you much more. 
Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Wife. And so there's this confrontation from uh, this human medium, but really God is speaking to David. Look, you've done what is evil. You've despised my word. You've done what's wicked in my sight. In fact, David, you have despised me. And so as we comb back through, before we jump into the first couple of verses of Psalm 51, I want us to pull out two things here. Firstly, sin is a despising of God. That's weighty language. It's not my language. This is what God tells Nathan to tell David. Look at it. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. That word in the original language can mean to view something as worthless. So we're talking about the most valuable treasure in the universe, God himself. And God says, David, you have treated me as though I am worthless to you you have viewed my word and my commands as worthless David knew the law he knew adultery and murder were against the law this isn't an accidental slip up this was an intentional transgression he knew what he was doing he knew it violated the law of God and God says you have despised me and look at this he connects how David despises him to David's actions You have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This whole sordid plan was really revealing to God, or or revealing from God to David in this moment that this is it, you despise me. Sin is a despising of God. And I think God uses this visceral language so that we might know that sin is a big deal. Though this was not written to us, it was written for us. And Nathan here, inspired by the Lord, says that David's sin was really a despising of the Lord. That God had given him boundaries and he just bulldozed through them and said, God, your ways and you are worthless. I'm going to do my own thing. Sin is a despising of God. How do you view sin? When you think of maybe the sins in your own life, as we were talking as a teaching team, there is kind of this um, uh, dichotomy that happens within us. As we look at the world, it's very easy to look out there at the world and the world systems and say, man, the world is, is, is going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. It's just so messed up. There's sin rampant everywhere. And it's very easy to identify sin out there. But when I look in a mirror, It's very easy to minimize my sin, to turn a blind eye to my sin. So how do you view sin? Do you perhaps minimize sin? Well, Jesus died for that, so it's okay. No, Jesus died for that. That should tell us that's not okay. That's a hefty price. Anytime we trivialize sin, we make grace cheap. And grace is not cheap. It took the precious blood of Jesus to die on the cross for you and I. So how do you view sin? And I, and I, don't, I don't, please hear my heart, I don't want anybody to feel shame. Shame leads to condemnation. That's not God's voice. What I do want though in this story, as we're reading together, I do want the Lord to convict us in places we need to be convicted. This can, because conviction can lead to transformation. So be honest with yourself. Have this conversation with your spouse, with your children, with a trusted friend. Just how, how do you view sin? Is it, are you making allowances in your life for sin? Jesus didn't die so that you have to walk in sin anymore. He set you free. He sent me free. We don't have to live in bondage or we don't have to walk in darkness anymore. We've been released from the prison. Our shackles have been undone. We've been called from darkness into light. You don't have to live that way anymore. So how do you view sin? Clearly David here, he's he's 
uh, managing his sin. That's the next thing I want us to see. Not only is sin a despising of God, but managing sin multiplies sins. Managing sin multiplies sins. Let's look at it in the passage. After David commits adultery, right? So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing, how they were, war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So David starts with adultery. And we know from the rest of the context of the story, this is not about Uriah getting a nice respite from war. David's trying to manage his sin. He's trying to cover it over. And so he's using his power to manipulate Uriah. He's brought him home, not as a nice gesture as his king to give him rest, but to cover over his sin that he might go sleep with his wife and think that the baby that she's conceived is his. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a long journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? He says, I can't do that. I would, that would be, I I, I couldn't exist in that space. That's not integrity. Like my heart is for the kingdom and my brothers are sacrificing out there. I can't come home and just rest like that's not going on, David. And so then David ups the ante. As you live and as your soul lives, Uriah says, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. Now, I want to be careful here. I don't want to make too much of something, but I do think it's very interesting, the wording in this last statement here. David invited him. David invited Uriah, and he ate, Uriah ate, in his presence and drank so that he, David, made him, Uriah, drunk. Now, What I don't believe this is saying is that Uriah is not responsible for his actions. Clearly, he is a a responsible party. But the author seems to want us to, to see that David has some responsibility here. He's abusing his power. He's manipulating Uriah. And it's led to Uriah getting into a drunken state. It's as though David has some culpability in Uriah's state here. So we've got adultery, we've got manipulation, we've got abuse of power, now we've got drunkenness. Do you see that as David tries to manage his sin, it just multiplies? It just grows? Like sin grows in the dark and dies in the light. And it continues. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house, even in this drunken state. He still doesn't. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. So we've got adultery, manipulation, abuse of power, drunkenness, conspiracy to murder. Sin just continues to grow and multiply as David tries to cover over and manage and hide it in the darkness. And as Job was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Ultimately, the the total fruition of this plan is the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. But I thought it was interesting as I was reading this a couple days ago, um, something just kind of popped out to me in the page. Some of the servants of David among the people fell. There were people who had nothing to do with Bathsheba, Uriah, Nathan, David, David, and they were innocent victims of David's scheme to cover up his sin. Managing sin multiplies sins. It just does. Sin grows well in the dark. 
And when we manage it, we're, we're, we're really, it's, it's evidence that we don't believe we can be fully known and fully loved. Because we're hiding it, we're covering it over, and we're saying, really, if this came into the light, I wouldn't be loved, I would be hated. I wouldn't be accepted. I would be rejected. We believe that if this ever came to the surface, love would disappear. And so I wear a mask and I pretend and I cover over and I manipulate circumstances and I manage my sin. Listen, you and I are no match for sin. Like the cross should be the the, the definitive statement about what kind of power it takes to overcome sin. The cross and the empty tomb. It took God to overcome sin. Jesus, that's what he did on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He took our sin upon himself and died in our place. That's what it took to deal with sin once and for all. And when we manage our sin... We are stepping in that place to say, I'll take care of it, Jesus. The cross was good and the resurrection, but I'll take care of this thing. You're no match for your sin. I'm no match for my sin. The way to kill it is to bring it into the light in two places, before God and before God's people. When we bring it to the light before God, we're reminded of the forgiveness that you and I have because of the cross, because of the empty tomb, because Jesus died in our place and took the cup of God's wrath, drinking every last drop of it. There's no wrath left for you and I. And we're also called to bring it to light in community. In the book of James, it says that when we bring sin to the light, there's healing that takes place. And so I want to ask of us, again, this is not a shame question. Please hear my heart. I want us to be led into conviction in the places the Lord wants to transform us. Are you managing sin? Are you covering it up and hiding it and, and, and managing? And do you see in David's story, David's story should be a, a, a visceral reminder to us that that doesn't work. That doesn't work. And ultimately, David's sin comes to the light because God knows. And even in this moment of David's sin coming to light, he's fully known and he's fully aware of it. God loves him, not by destroying him. That's what sin really ultimately deserves is just wiping out the sinner. But by lovingly bringing him someone to say, hey, you're in error. And look at what it produces in David. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. This is David's song after he, he realizes the error of his way and, and he decides, I'm, I'm, I'm turning back to the Lord. I was wrong. This is the song he writes. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. He does not say, have mercy on me, O God. I'm gonna try really hard. I'm gonna get accountability partners. I'm never gonna commit adultery again. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't strive for holiness and have accountability in it. Of course we should. What I am saying is David is not appealing to God's mercy because of his performance. He's appealing to God's mercy because God is a God of steadfast love. Steadfast love. That's the third thing I want us to see. God's love is steadfast. Right here in the passage, this word for steadfast love is, and I, don't, I can't speak Hebrew very well, but is chesed. And the idea behind it is it's such a robust term. It's, it can mean kindness, loving kindness, faithfulness, loyalty, uh, a love that produces acts of grace and mercy towards another. And so I kind of distilled down from uh, all the definitions that I saw just a simple statement of what chesed means. A loyal love that leads to actions of grace towards another. David doesn't deserve this love. But here, in the moment where his sin comes to light, in this repentance moment, he writes this song and he says, God, you are the God of chesed. You are the God of steadfast love. You are the God who has loyal love and you want to act graciously towards me. Do you believe that in the midst of your sin? 
You know, the, the, the Old Testament gets a bad rap often because people say, well, that Old Testament God. And I want to be clear, there's one God throughout the whole entirety of Scripture. It's one God. But people look at the judgment and the wrath in the Old Testament like, man, he, had, he was throwing a temper tantrum and Jesus calmed him down. But that's not the view that, G, that David has of God in the Old Testament when his sin comes to light. Look at what he says about him. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. It's as though David knew there's a record of wrongs and I need you, God, to to blot them out. I need someone outside of myself. There's nothing I can do to rid myself of sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That word thoroughly, it's, it's as though that David knew that these roots of the sin that he, he exhibited in this whole plot ran deep. The roots ran deep. And he needed a thorough cleansing of his life from the Lord. You know what David wants here? Jesus. He wants Jesus. He wants uh, the God who, who stepped down from his throne, lived the perfect life in his place and died on the cross for his adultery and manipulation and abuse of power and the drunkenness and the murder. He wants Jesus. He's crying out for a savior. God, I can't save myself. Will you save me? Will you blot out my transgressions? Will you wash me clean? That is what Christ did for you and I over a th- around a thousand years after this story. Jesus is on the scene and he dealt with sin once and for all. And because of his victory over sin, Satan, and the grave, you and I can live in the confidence that we are fully known and fully loved. Do you believe that? There is grace for you. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for sticking around uh, and and really uh, joining today in a a difficult message. Just self-evaluation. How do I view sin? Am I managing and covering up sin? And ultimately, do I believe that the Lord loves me despite my sin? despite my own unloveliness. And I want to just follow up with those questions. How do you view sin? Maybe you've never thought of that before. I want you to evaluate your life. Talk with your spouse. Um, if, if, and talk with a trusted friend. Ask them what they see in you. How do you view sin? Do you, do you trivialize it? Or maybe, maybe you make sin big and, and you think, man, it's so, such a big sin. There's no way God could forgive me. I'm just hopeless. Both of those extremes are false. Sin is a big deal, but it's not bigger than Jesus. And so how do you view sin? And the second thing I want to uh, challenge you to is what impact has managing sin had on you? Look, from the moment sin entered the garden, humanity has been trying to manage and hide their sin. It's just true. It's probably been part of your experience in this life, just like it has mine. And so Just evaluate for yourself. What were the consequences? What was the impact of that? Managing sin. And maybe you had a moment where you finally brought that sin into the light. What was that like for you? How did you experience the grace of the Lord in those moments from him and his people? Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you love us so much to die for us even though we were in rebellion and and not pursuing you in our wretched state. You pursued us in love. I pray that you would help us to be a people who believes we are fully known and fully loved. I pray that you would help us to see repentance as a beautiful gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for sticking around. Love you guys. Have a good day.